Good morning. I hope I can get your interest, although it's uh, quite early in the morning. Um, what I'm going to do briefly is to go through the um, Climate Adapt platform, what it is, what we're aiming at, how it's being used so far, and then I hand over to Sebastian Ebert, who is going to explain a bit more about the um, inclusion of the Baltic Sea region in the Climate Adapt platform. So we're actually very happy to have been collaborating um, with the Belt Adapt project to allow this uh, inclusion. But firstly, something about the platform. What is it and why it was set up? <coughs> Sorry, it's, um, it's aimed at uh, supporting policymakers who are interested in developing and implementing adaptation actions at different levels. Um, so that means also those who give advice to policymakers, I should say, because usually actually policymakers themselves don't probably look at the website as such uh, in detail. Um, it was launched in March 2012 by DG Climate Action, by the Commissioner, Connie Hedegaard, at the EA in Copenhagen. And um, the agreement is that since then the EA maintains the website, uh, we manage it, uh, but we still work very closely with DG Climate Action. We are supported by the so-called Topic Center on Climate Change Adaptation. This is an organization which is uh, funded by EA. We have actually a number of these topic centers, uh, in total six for different types of work areas. And they are contracted by EA to support us in different work areas, in particular in this case on adaptation. So this topic center is led by the CMCC in Italy, and it includes about 12 uh, other organizations across uh, Europe. But if you're interested in it, uh, you can find the information on our website. So um, just briefly what the platform contains. Um, basically, there are a number of key, you could say, tools available. So one is called the Adaptation Support Tool. That's um, on the left-hand side at the top. This tool um, guides you through a number of steps. It's um, actually quite well uh, known. This was originally, this idea originally was uh, coming from the UK Climate Impact Program. It has been used as a kind of tool to support development of adaptation in a number of different places. Also researchers have been using it and changing it somehow, but the basics are, I think, quite uh, quite stable, so it's, it's going through a policy cycle. Of course, that doesn't mean um, you have to go through all the steps. Uh, it might be that you're in a particular phase and then you can be having an interest in, in, uh, the, in, in another phase, which is part of this cycle. So it's more a tool to help you to find also the right information. It links quite a lot with the um, guidelines on national adaptation strategies, which I mentioned yesterday, which was published by the Commission. We haven't actually included all the details of this guidance document yet into this tool, but we are on the point of doing so. There is also an interesting additional tool which is following the same steps from um, uh, several projects uh, dealing with cities. I mentioned yesterday uh, the SIC ADAPT project and they have also followed the same approach but then looking at cities, so we also want to include that in more detail. Um, so that's one tool. Then another tool, or let's say overview, is on actions currently happening in countries. So um, I'm not going to show you this in detail, but um, we have for each country in the EEA 33 member countries, or almost all of them, I should say, the information available. This was provided by countries themselves. We have the information in um, terms of the policy framework, the assessments, uh, and the uh, analysis done uh, by each country, the uh, priority sectors for action, and also a summary of information. Um, that still is um, overall a summary, so there's much more available, of course, but the site then guides you to other further information for each country. Um, then we have something called the case study search tool. Uh, this allows you to find cases and examples of implemented actions which already have some adaptation element. Uh, often uh, actions have been taken for many different reasons. Adaptation uh, has been uh, one of the reasons and then this 
if adaptation was a key reason, I should say, then this can be included. We're now uh, upgrading this, we're changing this, uh, but there are a number of cases already uh, available there. And then finally, to mention uh, the database, uh, this is, um, uh, let's say, metadata of um, reports, publications, uh, tools, um, information in general available on specific uh, topics. We have about um, more than 1,000 uh, database items currently, and you can search your information based on keywords. The last thing I didn't actually mention, we also have a news and events uh, section where we show um, information across Europe uh, if it's uh, relevant and uh, seen as useful for, for the intended audience. So that's a very quick overview of the site. Then just a few um, statistics. Uh, we have about 15,000 unique visitors per month. Now that means people who click on the site. So that can mean somebody who's just there for a few seconds. It can also mean somebody who's going into the details. And we know it's not only EA staff. Um, that means it's quite well visited compared to other sections we have on the EA website. Uh, it's uh, one of the most visited places. The pages most visited, country profiles, the adaptation support tool, and also share information. I completely forgot to say that. It's very important, actually. Uh, it's possible for any user to provide the information through this share information section. Of course, then we go through steps of checking what the information provided is, but um, uh, our view is that if it's already checked and quality assured by the original organization, which is very key, of course, then we can uh, upload it. So what we do is we check more or less if the metadata is complete, if the source is, uh, is reliable, but we cannot, of course, check all the underlying details. So we are relying on the quality assurance of the providing organization itself. So that, that's, that's a key point, I think. A list of uh, uh, countries from which uh, the visitors mostly come and then from which direction they come, either direct link or they find it through Google, which is quite interesting, one of the, the largest shares, or they find it through the EA uh, website. We're uh, continuously uh, improving the site, so we have a list of um, improvement uh, activities. Um, firstly, I should actually say there have been a number of dissemination events organized by DG Klima in different locations over the last six months. Um, there is actually a, a, a video available. We're on, on the point of uploading that on guiding how you can use the site. Uh, we're about to issue a newsletter. We want to further enhance the information on transnational platforms or um, in general transnational information. And of course, we're very happy again, as I said, to be able to work with Gault Adapt, but there are other transnational regions um, uh, which we think can be um, improved in the, in the site, for example, the Alpine region. So we're working with the C3 Alps project to do that. And another point here is that um, the national adaptation platforms are still very key. This is providing a kind of entry point from the European perspective, but of course there is a lot of information available at national platforms in the national languages. So, um, so we need to further enhance the links. We're still improving these case studies. Uh, we are increasing also the um, uh, inclusion from key re EU research projects. DG Climate Action has a number of projects themselves, which we also then include, the outcomes of these projects. City information should be further enhanced. Something about Copernicus, very briefly, the, um, the idea is that um, once the Copernicus climate service is running, we would then have some interface from, from the Copernicus Climate Service to Climate Adapt, and that's something we really need to discuss with the consortia, which will be selected to maintain the climate, to, to develop the climate service under the Copernicus program. More information on funding is needed. That's something we're talking about with DG Climate Action. And I also mentioned yesterday we're working with West Balkan countries to include their information as well. Just a very a few other points. Um, um, as I said, there is an increased interest to share experiences on these types of adaptation platforms. 
we had a meeting in Copenhagen on 19 June where we had about 10 countries participating um, who are actively managing a, a website. In total, there were actually 17 countries, uh, also other organizations. Um, now, the idea is that um, we will have another workshop in November, 7 and 8 November, together with the Circle 2 project, which is an ERANET FV7 funded project dealing with climate change adaptation. Um, I'm inviting you actually hereby, if you're interested, you can participate. There is a registration on the possible on the site of Circle 2. Uh, and the idea is that if there is an interest across countries and a few other platforms, transnational platforms, to develop some kind of guidance of, of good practices that could be then considered at that workshop and we could see if we jointly want to develop such uh, good practice. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much and I'll hand over to Sebastian. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Andrea. And next speaker is uh, Sebastian Eber from German Federal Environmental Agency and he will speak on the same topic. Just continue. Yeah, good morning from my side. Um, obviously, my presentation was closed, um, but uh, I guess it is can, can assist me to, to find it again. Um, <clears throat> I would like to present you the new audits in regional subsection in the platform Climate Adapt. This um, subsection in Climate Adapt is another main output of the Badalak project. And the um, thanks a lot. And the um, um, initial idea of the Bada project was, uh, and that, that idea was formulated in the uh, application form and in the project data form of Bada was to develop a one-stop shop information portal, providing all or nearly all available information on climate change adaptation in the Baltic Sea region. This most likely should cover a general overview of the region, a background on the policy framework, something about impacts and vulnerabilities, and especially on adaptation actions and options. And furthermore, that um, platform should be the hub for decision makers from the Baltic Sea region, from the transnational level over the the national level, the subnational levels, down to the local level, and um, also, Badadap would love to see that um, platform as an important platform for disseminating results, actions, and to give also recommendations derived from the Badadap project. But not only, but also to include um, information from other initiatives. And one of the big questions during the project lifetime or let's say at least half of the project lifetime was how to create such a Baltic window as we called it in Baltadapt. And um, the answer to that question is um, the new Baltic Sea region subsection in Climate Adapt. When we thought about how to uh, develop a concept or how to implement then the concept, it became quite clear for us that there will be a lot of advantages when we try to integrate it in climate adapt so that at the end it is a clear win-win uh, situation for climate adapt on the one hand but also for wild adapt on the other hand. From the perspective of the climate adapt platform, um, the input from wild adapt means uh, strengthening of climate adapt as the EU's adaptation portal. It is also a strengthening of all sections in Climate Adapt through additional input, of course, from Bad Adapt, and especially the transnational region section in Climate Adapt is advanced. Um, for the Bad Adapt uh, group, um, the Climate Adapt platform offers a structured and in depth presentation of climate change and adaptation. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to make all information accessible in one known and central platform. And of course, there are a lot of additional information available 
in climate adapt that are really of use for also the users of the bad adapt information for instance the country profiles can be now directly accessed and um, I will show it a little bit later um, <clears throat> what I will present right now is um, the beta version of the website we are now at a state of implementation that is about let's say 90 percent and then I would say let's start the sneak preview of the new but uh, the, uh, the new Baltic Sea region subsection in climate adapt. Um, first of all, I would like to show you how to um, reach the new section. When you are on the uh, home of climate adapt, then you can click on the countries and other areas link. <clears throat> then you go further to the transnational regions. Here you see that there are many transnational regions of course in Europe and one of them is the Baltic Sea and this is the current status quo of information given on that site so this is one single page where very very briefly there is an information about climate change adaptation issues in the Baltic Sea region. The new subsection will look like this and um, what you see here is that um, the subsection is divided into four main topics. There is a general overview uh, here. There is um, something about the policy framework, the background of each and everything. There is a subsection on impacts and vulnerabilities in the region and, of course, on adaptation actions. Um, here you can see a brief overview of the information that is generally given for the Baltic Sea region and now I switch um, over to the web page we can a little bit or you can follow me by scrolling down into the web page um, the general information given for the Baltic Sea region um, in, is introduced by uh, threats to the environment of the Baltic Sea region and then very briefly it, it is explained that the topic of climate change adaptation um, derives from the EU strategy for, um, for the Baltic Sea region and that BAD ADAPT has had, or, yeah, has had a, a mandate to develop a proposal for the strategy and the action plan. This is very briefly introduced here on this page and when we click then on the policy framework, okay like that can happen. <laughs> can someone um, assist me? Um, yeah, I would like to go on then in the um, policy framework section because this is a better version. I have to log in. Look this up so I need the. Um, All right. So sorry for that brief interruption. Um, in the policy framework section, Okay, um, the sub page on the policy framework now presents a little bit more in detail uh, issues that we have heard about already yesterday. Um, again, 
that the base for the climate change adaptation actions in the Baltic Sea region is the EU strategy um, that BART ADAPT was asked them to um, develop a proposal for a BSR-wide climate change adaptation strategy and an action plan. You also find here the links where you then directly come to the adaptation strategy or the, the action plan and can download the PDF, for instance. Um, and furthermore, there are, um, there are organizations that are very relevant for the Baltic Sea region and adaptation mentioned here. First of all, of course, the Council of the Baltic Sea States. And Maxi Nachtigall yesterday has um, told you and uh, how the future of the proposal will probably be. And um, of course, there are also other relevant um, organizations, let's say like HELCOM or also the others. And those are uh, already uh, can be found here in the, in the database. I will say some words um, to the database at the end of my presentation. Then the third um, section is this, uh, in the new uh, BSR subsection is um, the one about impacts and vulnerabilities. And as you can see here on the, on the screen, this is a little bit different in the design. <clears throat> so here we have not only an HTML text that you can reach by clicking on the read more, but we also have here a so-called tripartite menu where we present uh, some selected items deriving from the database and those selective items are of a uh, higher relevance, so to say. So they should be highlighted here. And in the case of the impacts and vulnerabilities section, those are selected indicators, some publications and reports, and um, furthermore, some information portals. When we switch um, back now to the real web page, then, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it would, worse, would be worse to show you how it would look like in the real web page then. Um, then we get some uh, explanations here to, uh, on impacts and vulnerabilities. First of all, on observations and projections. For instance, the changes in temperature and salinity, the changes in precipitation, changes in sea ice conditions, and so on and so forth. Um, one focus on that part of the web page are sectoral impacts and vulnerabilities. And here, mainly the four focus topics that BiteAdapt looked on were presented. So that means um, biodiversity and tourism and food production and infrastructure. As you can see, there are some explanations on that. You find also BiteAdapt reports and um, some more detailed information you can here in session A after the coffee break presented by Inga Kramer, for instance, or also over there on the poster on biodiversity. Um, tourism will be, uh, will be a little bit more explained by Laila Kuhle in the session uh, C after the coffee break, for instance. And on this page, then there is a final uh, paragraph then there is a final paragraph uh, on uncertainties. Something um, that not derived from the BiteAdapt project, for instance, is um, an application that we also highlighted here, um, the Baltic's assessment of climate change for the Baltic Sea region. There is a summary on the um, Baltic's um, network and their work. And directly after my presentation, Hans von Storch will tell you something more about the BACC um, outcomes. Then. All right, then let's uh, 
have a look at the final section on adaptation actions. Here we again have a three part head menu highlighting some selected items of the database. The database covers a lot more. Um, and in the section on adaptation actions, there is again an introduction that mentions the um, BSR, Wild Climate Change Adaptation Strategy and the Action Plan. Of course, here is also a link to uh, case studies um, that uh, also derive from other initiatives, not only BART ADAPT. We outline um, some topics like climate mainstreaming and marine protection. Then we have a short paragraph about the cooperation and the special policy forums that we uh, conducted in, in, in the climate, uh, in the Baltada project. And an example that is worth to show about the issue of uh, knowledge transfer is, for instance, the Baltic Climate um, Toolkit. And again, when you then click here on that link, you have a direct access to another web page where you find some uh, interesting information. Uh, last but not least, um, when it comes to adaptation actions, all of us know that um, the financing is always a very big issue. <laughs> and also we try to include it here by giving a link to funding programs and, for instance, a bonus and the South Baltic program is um, also mentioned here. All right. Um, so this is um, the brief overview of everything, or nearly everything, you can find on the website. Um, I would like to also make you aware of um, something that was hidden here, and this is that green discover box where search results are presented. Um, those are the search results and the revenue from the database. And <clears throat> the, the database, and um, especially the search function, is not successfully running at this time. And the main reason for that is that um, the EEA, in general, is um, improving the search function of the whole database. So this is not specifically related to the Baltic Sea region subsection. But of course, if we would publish it right now, then it would not be a real benefit because the search function is not uh, fully, fully working at, um, at this time. But um, yeah, I'm quite sure that we will uh, publish it in a, in a little while, and then we all can um, enjoy the full functionality of the Baltic Sea region uh, subsection. Um, some more words to that. Um, database perhaps, and then I'm uh, already at the end of my presentation. Um, <clears throat> the database now, oh, sorry. Uh, when you go for a search on the database, then you find that uh, kind of a template where you can click, and some uh, improvement might be that we will then have an additional uh, possibility to select um, also the Baltic Sea region as, as one item for an extended search. So that improves a lot um, the search functionality to our minds. Um, all in all, we will have then more than 100 database entries and search results for the Baltic Sea region. And within uh, Byte Adapt, there were almost 80 new items that were um, delivered to the European Environment Agency um, covering items, uh, database entries on projects, publications and report, tools, and also organizations. And yeah, already 55 of them are verified, and the verification is an ongoing process uh, done by the EEA. And yeah, it will take a little while, but uh, I will all of you inform then when the uh, subsection is really alive. 
so then you have the opportunity to enjoy it a second time. So then I'd like to thank you for your intention and I also want to say many thanks to uh, Andre Jol and his group from, from AEA, to uh, Walter Kahlenborn and his team from Adelphi who was our subcontractor for developing the concept and assisting in the implementation. Furthermore, I'd like to say many thanks to all uh, project partners of Bart Adapt and especially my closest colleague Sonja Otto from UBA. That it was from my side, and um, I keep you informed about the new subsection. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. It's always to talk about <clears throat> internet tools. It's it's never enough. So, but time it's running, and uh, I would like to ask um, for the next speaker. Uh, we will have uh, still little time for for question and answer. So, uh, next speaker, it's. Um, <clears throat> Hans von Stroch from the uh, Institute of Coastal Research, and he will talk about the ACC results, climate change, and impact. Good morning. Unfortunately, the screen is not too large, and I guess you cannot always see what I wanted to show. So the back effort, that is the project which was started maybe ten, almost 10 years ago within the Baltex Scientific Corporation. And Baltex has recently transformed itself into something called Baltic Earth, which goes along with uh, juvenilization. That means older people like me are sorted out and you are, are coming at the helm, which is positive. Now, um, what is this back part? That is an effort to establish which scientifically legitimized knowledge about climate change and its impacts is available for the Baltic Sea catchment. Back one had about 80 scientists from 12 countries joining together to document and assess the published knowledge in 2008. The interesting part is that the assessment has been accepted by Helcom as a basis for its future deliberations. So we had an interesting division of labor between science and policy making. To make one thing very clear, which is often very difficult to understand it seems, BAC is not an assessment of the state of climate, climate change and impact. It is an assessment of the scientific knowledge about this. This is not the same. In particular, the scientific knowledge can change. It will be different in five years' time. And it may be that in five years' time we say what we said in 2013 is no longer adequate. We have new evidence. It has become false. And we are not talking about the best knowledge because that's a subjective decision. That somebody is considered the best scientist, which usually is not correct, usually it's only the loudest. And I'm speaking rather loud now. So it's an assessment of knowledge for the Baltic Sea region. And we have a number of principles. So the assessment is a synthesis of material drawn comprehensively from the available scientifically legitimate literature. And scientifically legitimate is peer-reviewed literature, conference proceedings, and reports of scientific institutes, say, as a major eye. We do not allow influence or funding from groups with political, economical, and ideological agendas. To be clear, we do not accept Munich Re. We welcome questions from such groups, but we do not welcome answers. By the way, I should also mention here, we have no funding, no specific funding, so we have also no influence by political administrations, neither on any national level nor on the European level. So we are independent. Third, if a consensus view cannot be found, 
in the above-mentioned literature. This is clearly stated, and the different views are documented. The assessment thus encompasses the knowledge about what scientists agree on, but also identify cases of disagreement and knowledge gaps. And finally, the assessment is evaluated by independent scientific reviewers. In 2008, we had our first report, which is a relatively big book, and the main results were the following. Presently, warming is going on in the Baltic Sea region and will continue throughout the 21st century, and Buck considered, considers it plausible that this warming is at least partly related to anthropogenic factors. So we didn't say it is, but it is plausible, and there are good reasons why we did so because there was no literature which showed it is. There are only claims that it is. In 2008, it's better now. So far, and in the next few decades, the signals limited to temperature and directly related variables such as ice con sea ice conditions. Wait, later, we expect changes in the water cycle to become obvious. This regional warming will have a variety of effects on terrestrial and marine ecosystems, some predictable, such as the changes in phenology, others so far hardly predictable. Now, the new report, which is almost done and has already been taken over by Helcom in its own uh, report, we have the following main points. First, the new assessment from 2013 finds the results of PAC-1 from 2008 valid. So we did not need to revise major things. We have, however, significant detail and additional material now, and some contested issues have been reconciled, for instance, issue about how much the sea surface temperature was warming. The ability to run multimodal ensembles seems a major addition, and we heard about that yesterday. First sign of detection studies show up, but attribution is still weak. Indeed, these two words, detection and attribution, seem to be largely unknown in this community. On the other hand, in the IPCC, these are two of the really big words. Regional climate models still suffer from partly severe biases, and we have been demonstrated yesterday. The effect of certain drivers that is, for instance, our souls and land use change on regional climate statistics cannot be described by these models at this time. That means a major climate signal we likely have seen here, namely the reduction of the presence of our souls since 1990 in Europe, we cannot say what that effect was. We know a lot about the future, it seems, or we claim to know that, but we do not know such a massive signal we, which we had. And nobody seems to be really concerned about it. Data homogeneity is still a problem and sometimes not taken seriously enough. Then the issue of multiple drivers and ecosystems and social economy is recognized, but more efforts to deal with are needed. And in many cases, the relative importance of different drivers, not only climate change needs to be evaluated, but this is underway second page of this. Estimates of future deposition and fluxes of substances like sulfur and nitrogen oxides and so forth depend on future emissions and climate conditions. However, atmospheric factors seem to be relatively less important than emission changes. In the narrow coastal zone where climate change and land uplift act together, plant and animal communities had to adapt to changing environmental conditions. Climate change is a compounding factor for two major drivers of freshwater biogeochemistry, but evidence is still often based on a small scale. The effect of climate change in this respect cannot be quantified yet on a Baltic basin-wide scale. Scenario simulations suggest that most probably uh, the Baltic Sea will become more acid in the future, increase oxygen deficiency, temperature, change, salinity, and increased acidification will impact the marine ecosystem in several ways, and may erode the resilience of the ecosystem. And there's an increasing need for adaptive management strategy. That's what you are talking here about. 
Now, one element is, of course, that we had to say what were the change in the past 200 years. And I personally think it's equally important to talk about the recent past than about the future, even though there's a tendency to speak only about the future, which has the distinct advantage that you can verify these statements only in 20 years' time when some of you are retired. In general, the conclusions of PAC-1 are confirmed. We have new results such as persistence of weather types have seem to have increased. We have looked into upwelling um, issues. Evidence of the recent water warming has been uh, uh, now verified. We have more extensive results for several parameters, in particular on sea level. And the runoff changes are explained by temperature. Warming is associated with less runoff in southern regions and more runoff in northern regions. Uh, this is a busy diagram, and I guess you can see hardly anything, but you may be able to see that there's a diagram on the right-hand side, which shows the temperature development in blue for the northern part of the Baltic Sea region and in red for the southern part, for, from top down for the year, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And you see that we have a part of winter, that's the second diagram on top, we see uh, warming going on, and the strongest... Uh, uh, warming we have in spring, but uh, as I said, not in winter. Uh, from the greenhouse gas concept, we expect that there is a recent warming. We do not expect a trend throughout the entire 100 years. So if we have a trend throughout the entire 100 years, it is not CO2. Only if it's accelerated in the end, then it's CO2. So we expect a certain type of signal. So this is a key diagram which shows us there's really something changing, albeit not in winter so far. Uh, we have heard yesterday that regional climate models are not yet a perfect tool. We have large biases in reproducing the observed climate. We have the inability to deal with certain drivers, in particular aerosol loads. We have most, most uh, efforts so far have disregarded the dynamic coupling of the Baltic Sea, regional atmosphere and other Compartments, I would say SMHI is again one of the leaders of improving this. And, uh, well, we heard Eric's presentation yesterday on that. But this is something we really, really need. It is better to have a Baltic Sea in your model when you model climate change in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, these diagrams I've seen are in the documents here, which uh, tell us something about the range of projected changes of temperature. Uh, and maybe it, it, on the left-hand side, you see the smallest change, and on the right-hand side, the largest change, and the middle, uh, an average. And this is across, I forgot how many, 10 or so ensemble simulations. Um, and uh, you see, in terms of, in, in top, it's winter, bottom is summer. You see it's warming throughout. Uh, this situation is different with precipitation. Precipitation always is behaving less well. Uh, here we have the same type of diagram, and we see in the top three diagrams it's uh, getting wetter in all models, but in summer the situation is different. Some models prefer to say in the south we should have it drier, in the north wetter. And some models say it should be wetter everywhere. So this is one of the open things, and let's see uh, how things will develop. And I'll come back to that a little later. We also have first results with such uh, coupled models. Uh, no, this is not coupled models, I think. Um, what would happen with salinity, obviously a factor of great importance for ecosystem studies. And what we have so far is pointing towards uh, uh, fresher water conditions. However, uh, the number of scenarios we have here is rather limited, so we are using only a limited number of climate models for running this. And also we have seen that the hydrological descriptions in these models are so-so. So we would say... Uh, take this as a hypothesis or a suggestion. Don't take it as the last word. This may change. So this is a contested issue. The environmental impacts, and you have not given me any signs so far? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So environmental impacts. The main changes in air pollution in the Baltic region sea region are due to changes in emissions rather than climate change itself. That's not too surprising, right? More riverine dissolved organic matter is expected. Effects on, of climate on cultivated watersheds is unknown. We expect both positive and negative feedbacks on nutrient fluxes 
and we expect that agricultural practices will adopt fast. Terrestrial ecosystems near the coast are most prone to climate change, and uh, we also expect significant increase in spruce growth in the north. There will be a little more on that in a minute. Higher turnover of algal biomass may lead to larger anoxic areas. pH will decrease. Um, when we say higher turnover may lead to larger anoxic areas, it does not mean that we say we expect it in any case. But if we have a higher turnover of algal biomass, which could may be considered plausible and possible, then regime shifts in the Baltic Sea ecosystem have been observed they may be related to climate variability. Not necessary to climate change. Could also be related to something else. Lower salinity may lead to less marine benthic species uh, and unknown for pelagic groups. May. It's again this shaky thing. And of course, in the overall debate, there's a certain tendency of transforming the word may to will. In particular, be by interested parties, but we insist on May. Yeah, thank you. More specifically, marine ecosystems, higher temperature, that's something we really expect. These may go along with stronger growth in general, earlier plankton blooms, modification of species composition, possibly advantages for blue algae, invading of foreign species, and uh, something very concrete, threatening of ringed seals, because of loss of ice cover. If we get lower salinity, and we would suggest that we do not take that as a final word, it may be so, but it may possibly also not so. But if it would be so, we would also have changing species composition, immigration of new species, uh, the impact of oxygen supply in deep waters, which may be uh, associated with problems for fisheries concerning cod, and uh, also uh, changes in the distribution and composition of zooplankton and zoopanthus. Uh, uh, for agriculture and forestry, um, we would expect that conditions for forestry uh, is improving in the north, but this may be counteracted by unfavorable impacts in the south. Uh, in the north, we will have growing conditions uh, that will improve, but in the south, uh, these conditions may be reduced because of reduced precipitation and increased temperatures. But these are all kind of uncertain statements. This uh, will also cause changes in forest structures and diversity. Urban complexes, and again, we speak about what, we, what our lead authors found in the um, literature. I forgot to speak about that. So we have, again, uh, lead authors for all these chapters. And uh, uh, so, for instance, I have not written a single chapter of these. I'm part of the steering committee, and so the authors are independent in that sense from the from, uh, this uh, steering committee. The steering committee uh, has defined the chapter structure, has selected uh, the lead authors, these are several, uh, and has uh, organized the review process. Now, the urban complexes, the impacts differ uh, due to location, northern, southern part of the catchment, directly at the coast or not. Uh, and so e every urban complex is a unique mixture of infrastructure and urban services, inhabitants, natural resources, and green spaces, built structures, economic and societal factors. So it is hardly possible to generalize potential extent of climate change impacts from single case studies. I think that's a pretty strong statement which our lead authors have made here. Um, the climate change impacts, which are most relevant in this context, are sea level rise, extreme events like storm surges and changing precipitation patterns, flooding expected uh, related to heavy precipitation increase uh, pre uh, events. As the net sea level rise is expected to be higher in the southern Baltic uh, Sea, the southern coastal cities such as Gdansk will be more effective than northern cities. We also had quite a bit on uh, the changes in coastal erosion and coastlines over the past years. Uh, we have higher water overflow on the coast during storm surges caused by sea level rise and beach lowering. 
We had a bigger rate of erosion of beaches, dunes, and cliffs. Now, each Baltic country notices up to two meter coastal erosion per year on average in most threatened areas. Coast withdrawal with a higher rate. Till the end of the 20th century, it was 0.2 to 0.5 meter, and now it's uh, between uh, 0.5 to 1 meter per year. Uh, uh, above, uh, after above average storm surge, uh, re the retreat is of the order of 5 to 10 meter on land. We have more flooding in low-lying areas uh, or, uh, or river mouth and lagoons, and uh, we expect that longer coastal sections are subject to protection measures. Now, the last point is detection attribution. Detection means, can we say that a recent change we've seen is beyond natural variability, beyond what the system is showing in any case independent of what people do. If we find that this change is beyond that, it does not mean that it's man-made. It only means there is a cause, or a partial cause, and we do not know which. So first we have to find out, is there a change which is worth to be deconstructed? And we can say that we now have detected non-natural influences on regional warming. This is in the literature. And with the tools we have available, we can explain this only by increased greenhouse gas concentrations. The present trend we see in terms of temperature is consistent with model scenarios. That is, we also have an attribution, and we say the most plausible explanation is greenhouse gas warming. However, after having said, we don't know what the aerosol reduction did. Of course, I have to add a caveat. We have not studied that, so we don't know what the role of that is. Of course, there could also be some funny worms in the soil which do something, and we have never seen these worms. So there may be explanations around we have not thought of so far. But from the, what we have studied, we can say CO2 is a valid explanation. That's a different statement than CO2 is it. It says we can explain it. And there may be different ways to explain it. But we know only one so far. That's our best knowledge. In the detail, this is a very different statement of it is CO2, period. At the, but the, right, the correct statement is, at present, we can't explain it otherwise other than with CO2, which is good enough, I'd say. Detection of non-natural components and trends of precipitation amounts, we cannot. Present trends are larger than what is anticipated by models, so we have no consistent explanation for the time being. We have a lack of studies on detection changes of other variables, snow cover, runoff, sea ice, and we have lack of studies in the effect of other drivers, in particular the RSO business. And I have here a diagram which is maybe, no, let's just jump to the precipitation. The diagram which shows us changes, trends in the past 30 years, if I remember correctly, in terms of precipitation. In gray, you see the observed change averaged across the Baltic Sea region. And we have three different uh, sources for estimating that. We have also, and we have that for DJF, so winter, spring, summer, fall, and the annual mean. Then we have red bars in the gray bars, which is indicating the internal variability. It's estimated from paleo simulations, very long paleo simulations. And when this red bar is not crossing the zero, it means the trend we see here is not due to internal variability. We can't explain it with natural variability. So there is a cause. So we can say we detect something in uh, uh, winter and in fall not in the other seasons. And now the question, what is it? And we have then the ensemble uh, simulations, and that is in green. And again, we have an uncertainty derived from the ensemble variability in, with black bars. And then we see in DJF, uh, first uh, uh, the observed change is larger. 
uh, and it's also so in, uh, Mar in spring, not very much so, and uh, we have a special problem in, in fall. And, but we see that we could say, hmm, given the uncertainty in winter, this is consistent. In uh, spring, it is consistent. Also in June, July, August, it's consistent. But in fall, it's opposite. And the error bars, if you, or uncertainty bars, are separate. So we have something in fall which needs an explanation outside of internal variability. But it's not CO2. Could also be that the models are wrong, or blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. But with the present knowledge we have, we cannot explain it by CO2. That should make us nervous. It could be the aerosol part, for instance. We don't know. But here is a gap. A gap which we have to address. And we need also to think much more of the future as something like a continuation of what is presently going on. There's this tendency in the impact community that they study and talk all the time quite happily about changes in 2050 and 2100. Somehow they don't speak about present change. And we should do that much more to be sure what the reasons are, in particular when we have a theater like the Baltic Sea where we have several actors at the same time. So this brings me to the end and a little bit of propaganda. Namely, we will have a conference in Czechin and I have the, I'm not sure how many people from Poland are here, uh, about climate change, the environment and social economic response, which will take place in May next year. And uh, from what you are t discussing here, it may be that some of you would find it interesting to join that conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hans. It's a small gift for you. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, next presenter and next speaker will be um, Robert. Besbroek from Wanneganen University, and um, as I see from your presentation from the topic, is it Europe, uh, Europe adapting? Will you provide uh, answers or, no, or no, raise no, more no. questions? Only questions. Only questions. Um, let me start by saying that I'm a political scientist from Wageningen University, and um, thank you for uh, for attending this presentation. Uh, I'd like to start my presentation with a, a little bit different uh, kind of uh, short story. And it's, it's actually a story about corn. Uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of technological innovation in the United States around agriculture. And one of these innovations uh, was related to uh, the production of corn, uh, especially hybrid uh, forms of corn. And these kinds of uh, technological innovations became available around uh, the beginning of the I'm oh, sorry, by the end of uh, 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 the uh, 1920s. Um, and by that time, uh, a lot of farmers uh, started to adopt these uh, new um, seeds in order to uh, improve their uh, productivity of their, of their uh, farms, uh, of, their, of their yields. Uh, the new seeds were more uh, drought uh, protected uh, and they were easier to harvest. So in 1994, there was a famous study by uh, Ryan and Gross, um, and they actually uh, started with the question, what are the kind of the patterns of the diffusion of this innovation uh, into the agricultural community? And they looked at the state of Iowa and looked at uh, almost 260 farms or something, and they asked specific questions about the reasons why farmers adopted this new seed. And they found a very, very interesting curve. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's very clear, but um, they actually found that in the first five years, there's about 10% of the, of the uh, farmers started to adopt um, the new seeds. And they, they labeled them as being the early adopters. So after a year or five or so, um, there was a massive increase uh, in the, let's say, the followers that recognized the benefits of, of um, 
of the new seeds for their for their own farms and uh, and after a year or I don't know exactly but I have a point okay I think about uh, around here you see that uh, almost all but two uh, farms had actually adopted the new seed so we were uh, we were actually interested to see whether or not this kind of thing also is visible in climate change adaptation policy um, because in political science, and I'm a political scientist myself, we have kind of similar models to explain how policy diffuses across different countries, how different policies learn from each other, how different policies got adopted, how certain uh, new policies in certain countries influence the policy choices made in other countries. So actually we posed a number of, of, of questions. Uh, so for example, what motivates countries to, to adopt new policies? What are the barriers to the adoption and diffusion of these, these policies? And how are the learning and interaction processes uh, between these, um, these countries shaped? And can we actually, based on the existing literature about policy diffusion, say something about the mechanisms that are very important to understand when we talk about the, these diffusion processes? So one of the challenges that we encountered very quickly from the beginning is actually that there are not really data sets available to do these kinds of uh, policy diffusion analysis. You need really in-depth uh, qualitative and quantitative data in order to, to do such a, a diffusion analysis. So um, we actually conducted a survey among uh, 27 European countries um, and uh, asked them more or less the same questions that uh, Ryan and Gross asked in 1943, what are the reasons that you are adopting your policies? What are the challenges that you encountered? Uh, and these kinds of questions. And we, in doing so, we, we, we took a, an, what is called a Walker analysis, an internal-external variable approach, trying to identify the internal and external variables that could explain the processes of policy diffusion. There was another challenge, and I think most of you, uh, and I think I've, I've heard it uh, several times during this this, this conference um, is about what is actually diffusing, what is adaptation policy. So it goes back to the, to the fundamental question. Uh, and we used a, um, a figure that I recently published with a colleague of mine uh, um, in Global Environmental Change about um, uh, the disentangling of, of adaptation policy as a concept in order to measure it. And so what we actually see in this figure, and the most important thing is, I think, these two dimensions, intentionality, so the intention in which the policy is designed and the substantiality is the dimension in which the uh, policy is actually can help us to solve uh, uh, the problem. And we decided to focus on the high intentionality types of, of, of policy, so not including the contributive policy. And there are specific reasons for that, the most important one being um, that we are looking for policy innovation diffusion. So. Innovation, by definition, is high intentional uh, policy uh, designed to deal with, with, with climate change. So having sorted that out, the first thing we, we did is when we got the survey results back is try to see if we could have an eye, the same curve as the Ryan and Gross study had. And what we actually found is that it's, it's, an, it's a linear line. It's not S-shaped. So there's apparently not really an, uh, a, a kind of a, uh, uh, early uh, adopters um, followers and, and laggers uh, in, 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 in climate change uh, policy diffusion. So this, this, this figure requires a bit of explanation. Um, we actually try to assign a certain, let's say, innovation score, uh, a Walker score. Uh, the Walker score is kind of uh, uh, a little bit complex formula uh, in order to calculate the extent to which a country is uh, is kind of adapting or, or innovating on, on a certain policy topic. Um, and the assumption we had and the, the, the hypothesis we started with is that countries with, who have um, a high innovation score are more driven by internal or external variables than countries who have no uh, major drivers, or, or, or sorry, which have a, a low innovation score. And what we actually see is, is quite the opposite, although the, the, the the slope is not really uh, that strong. Uh, another interesting thing that we note from the figure is actually that the drivers mentioned by the uh, survey respondents are more or less in a, in a range between 2.5 and 4.5. So all the countries more or less agree that the external drivers are very important variables. So for example, um, European adaptation policies uh, that are, are currently coming up as an example of an external 
driver. So, but when we add the internal drivers, uh, not, not much changes actually. Uh, we, we see a quite coherent picture um, suggesting that the drivers for adaptation policy, uh, adoption and diffusion, are more or less the same, independent of whether a country has adopted a, nas a national adaptation policy or, or, or anything else. This was a bit surprising because this is contradictory to what the theory would, we would expect from the theories. We did the same for the barriers and what this picture clearly shows is that there is a, a, a large, much larger spread of the, of the responses. Some countries agree that yes, there are very large barriers in the upper range, more, more than four. Uh, well, the UK, for example, says, well, no, there are not really any barriers. We, we've already uh, done quite a lot of things. Um, and this is kind of a, yeah, th this is not really what we expected. We expected a bit more like this picture. Um, and these are the internal barriers. Uh, and the internal barriers are examples, are for example, um, political, uh, the lack of political awareness, the lack of institutional capacity uh, of the individual countries in order to adapt, uh, adopt a certain uh, policy. And what we actually see from this figure, and it's, it's much more clearer than the, the driver's um, um, uh, the driver's slide that I, I showed previously, is that the external barriers are rather below the internal barriers. So for, for some reason, the internal barriers are more important and more uh, explaining the uh, adoption and diffusion process uh, compared to the, to, the, um, to the external barriers. So, and we, of course, did a, a, a bit of uh, further analysis and to see which of these variables were ac actually explaining this, this process. And what we found is that only uh, political urgency to adapt, the lack of political urgency to adapt, and the lack of institutional capacity were the almost significant kind of uh, related to the innovation scores. The other drivers and, and, and barriers were not really explaining the, 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 the patterns and the adoption uh, patterns that we showed. So another question is um, we pose to the respondents of the survey is the diffusion from where and why did the diffusion take place? And that's a, yeah, it's, it's clear. <laughs> um, all the survey respondents actually said, well, the UK is, is the most uh, advanced and we actually modeled or at least uh, looked at uh, the UK as being the most important uh, source of inspiration for our adaptation policies. And second is Germany and Finland is the third. And this, this is something we would expect based on the existing qualitative studies that show that the UK and Germany and Finland are actually one of uh, three of the four uh, three of the four running countries on, on adaptation policy. So we, we asked also why, why did you look at these countries specifically? Um, and what, what comes clear from this, uh, from this table is that uh, they don't really look at the um, countries in the sense that they are focusing on policy effectiveness, for example, which, which would normally make sense that you first look at if a policy is effective or not and then try to incorporate it in your own country. Uh, but they look at whether or not they have a certain institutional setting. They look whether or not they are uh, actively uh, engaged in climate change adaptation policies. And these kinds of criteria are... Um, are, uh, are considered to be more important. So from the, um, from the figure I showed earlier, um, there are a, lo a number of deviant cases. And deviant cases are cases that, are, that stand out from the rest. And, and one of them is Sweden. Uh, and I thought Sweden would be a nice example to, to show at this conference. Uh, because Sweden has a very low innovation score. And th th that makes sense because at the national level there is not really an, a national adaptation policy. So and they're not really strong instruments, uh, which would explain, of course, the low innovation score. But they really scored low when it came to the barriers and the, and the drivers. Uh, there was a, a proposition for developing a national adaptation strategy, but in the end it was refuted by Parliament because there was some kind of redundancy within the system that would, uh, would uh, result as a consequence of uh, adopting a new national policy. Um, another deviant case is perhaps the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is interesting because we had a very strong, I say we because I'm from the Netherlands, uh, we had a, a very strong national adaptation policy uh, between 2006 and 2009. And then there was a kind of a strange situation that there was a political decision um, to refocus 
our very broad spatial planning approach into a more focused water-related water delta program kind of approach, which also includes a bit of spatial planning and nature conservation, but the focus uh, clearly shifted, and also the responsibility ch responsibilities shift shifted. So what is interesting to note is that um, uh, the national adaptation strategy was sort of dismantled after 2010, and there was a very critical report uh, from the uh, Court of Audit of the Netherlands saying that, well, there's not really a much of cohesion or co uh, coordination in the Netherlands, only on water management, so maybe we should develop a new national adaptation strategy. So the government is now preparing a new ad national adaptation strategy for 2017. So some observations in, um, in general, coming to, um, to an end, I think. Um, policy if diffusion, as we expected from th theory, is not really as we see it happening in, in, in practice. Um, but there are some mechanisms that we uh, identified, and I haven't shown the, the, the figures um, in this presentation, but it was particularly uh, the mechanisms of learning and mimicking. So it's about the policy, um, uh, it's looking for policy opportunities rather than uh, copying uh, how existing institutions work. That's the example of learning. Whereas mimicking is more of adopting more or less the same instruments that other countries have used uh, into your own country. So the focus is on, on finding policy opportunities rather than policy effectiveness. So when I had a discussion with some of you um, uh, yesterday, and um, one of the discussions was, uh, was about coercive mechanisms. Are lagger countries, countries which have not really adopted a national adaptation policy, waiting for coercive mechanisms from the European uh, Commission, for example? Or, and that this could be very interesting, and that relates more or less to the, to the presentation Andre Ol gave uh, yesterday morning, uh, do we need some kind of competitive mechanisms, mechanisms that would force countries to, well, to look at their own agenda and see whether they are related to uh, how they are doing compared to other countries. And, and at the political level, this is also, also a very uh, good, or how do you say, <laughs> instrument to get things done. So um, we actually said uh, that things such as the European Climate Change Adaptation Strategy and, the, and also the Belt Adapt Strategy are, ex are actually external drivers for adoption of national policies. But the question is, of course, what do we do with the internal barriers? Because the internal barriers are more explaining the adoption and diffusion process. So maybe this is something to think about. Um, the presentation, in the presentation, it might seem that countries that have a national adaptation strategy are more adapted, but that's, that's definitely not true. I mean, when we look back at the figure uh, I presented earlier, in a country that has a very strong national adaptation policy doesn't mean that they are more adapted to climate change. There are far more floods in the UK than there are in the Netherlands. And there are far more um, uh, drought events in, uh, no, well, the message is clear, I think. Another thing I wanted to stress, and this comes from the, um, from the deviant case uh, uh, analysis, is, is the vertical uh, diffusion process. We talked about horizontal diffusion as how countries learn from each other, but there is also a vertical diffusion process. Um, and two are, are very interesting in the context of climate change, I guess, and, and one is the snowball effect, where local or regional activities lead to state adoption of a national policy, or what is being known as a pressure valve effect, where local adaptation strategies or where local efforts or regional efforts um, renders a, a national policy uh, to be obsolete. And I think the, this is a, a very interesting uh, kind of mechanism that's currently going on in, in, in the case of Sweden. So it could be a snowball or it could be a pressure valve effect. So and the final remark is that there is a tendency to develop an, uh, a kind of a, a framework that fits all the countries uh, how to best adopt, adapt to climate change. We should have a national adaptation strategy, we should have a communicative uh, organization, we should have this, we should have that. Well, we look at the, the, the literature on welfare states, on, on other very large-scale uh, um, societal issues, we know that the, the, type pol the type of policies that countries adopt are far more influenced by their state tradition than the overarching frameworks that are uh, uh, suggested by um, by national or sorry transnational uh, uh, institutes. I think I'll leave it at this. Thank you.
Thank you, Robert. That's really uh, interesting. <laughs> Small gift for, from organizers. And um, now it's time for questions. I, uh, if you have questions, please also name uh, to whom, to which, to which speaker are you addressing it. And uh, uh, I, will, I will remind that it was um, uh, presentation of the instrument called um, or IT Platform Climate Adapt. We get a presentation by, by Hans on uh, the ACC and the last one on policy social issues, issues mainly by Robert. Uh, so who would like to, Robert would like to ask. Okay. For yourself, okay. And uh, I have a question to Hans. Um, you talked about a uh, systematic assessment of. Uh, you, sorry, is does it work? Oh, sorry. Uh, you talked about uh, a systematic, uh, or at least an assessment of the current state of knowledge. And I was wondering what kind of methodology is do you, did you use in, in collecting all your scientific um, information? Because this is something that the IPCC is also. Um, facing with? I would say we try to mimic the IPCC approach. So uh, I used to call back a mini IPCC. Yeah. However, um, I mean also in the IPCC there is of course an assessment of knowledge about all of Europe and that includes the Baltic Sea. These are just a very few people. We are much more people doing so and among uh, the people we have at our board are quite a few who speak Polish and Finnish and I would guess in the IPCC there are less of that sort. So we are really overlooking a much larger body of literature than the IPCC can do. And I suggest, and I spoke with Andre on that yesterday, why would that not possibly be a kind of a format which could be applied elsewhere in Europe so that the regional scientific communities organize themselves somehow and assess which knowledge is available there and the key point is that, which is, I think, is really important for, for all of us to know, what are the contested issues? That's what right. is open? Where may we expect surprises in future? And we have not had very much on that in the past, and I would appreciate it if we had more. The, the, reason, the reason for my question actually is because um, there's been a lot of criticism about the approach the IPCC is taking, because although it's a very kind of reviewing all the scientific literature, it's not really a very transparent way of which papers are included and which ones are excluded. So I was, I was wondering if you uh, thought about that in your, uh, in, in your assessment and how to do that transparently. Uh, not in a really systematic manner. So we, we're just appealing to the lead authors and we have quite a few contributing authors to make sure that they really have all the relevant literature. And we are asking people also in the review process, hey, are you aware that significant parts are overseen here? And, but there's no guarantee that we are complete and I'm sure that when people look closer to that and I hope they will they will find cases where we would say well we could have done that better and we actually we are also prepared other than the IPCC to um, be informed that something went wrong so we have a web page where people can write uh, this and that went wrong and you forgot this and that and I hope this would be used more and I'm sure that we will have gaps and we will have misassessments because we're all humans. No, still. Okay, thank you. I have a question to Sebastian about the platform uh, and the and the, you show the region, the Baltic Sea region, as you define it, and it includes relatively large areas of uh, northern Russia, northwestern Russia, which is. Uh, outside of areas where we read, most often run our regional climate models. Uh, so I'm wondering a little bit about what kind of data and information that goes into what you write about future possible climate change in that area. That is one thing and also, also concerning the region. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised to see that all of Norway is included in, 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 in the map as well since Norway is most of Norway is well outside of the Baltic Sea region. There is a small part of Norway that uh, where, where uh, water is flow, flowing to, towards the Baltic Sea, but, but uh, most of Norway is not. And, and I mean, if you start writing about uh, consequences for fisheries, etc., then Norwegians, they don't really care about the Baltic Sea. So. 
Yeah, of, um, of course, I see your point that um, some of the geographic hill area perhaps is not um, identified by the Baltic Sea region, but more to the um, eastern Atlantic, like Norway or the northeast of Russia. Um, the reason for the, the the map is that it is um, due to um, the the setting of uh, DG Ridge, I guess, who um, defines the, the setting of the transnational region in a way. So this is um, the map that is um, defined by DG Ridge in a way and um, yeah, and of course there is there is a gap then with with the data, perhaps um, presented there in, in the in the text, and this is um, the data we used from the um, bottled up climate info bulletins, in a way. So again, we have to face here that there are some gaps, and probably this can be improved, uh, for instance, by the work uh, done so far from from the back community, or uh, have this uh, yeah have to be solved in the future um, somehow. Or perhaps a question back, would you be in favor then not presenting such uh, data there so that there are no um, outlooks or no projections given in any way? And the only thing is that if you want to have some kind of scientific foundation for the climate change part of it and you would like to lean on the back work, for instance, then you should restrict yourself to the Baltic Sea region uh, as it's defined there. Otherwise, you need to look into other assessments. And there, there are maybe some assessments and, or, or you need to have someone look up the literature and see what are the climate change issues in these areas. For instance, for the northwestern part of Russia, climate change in winter is generally much stronger uh, compared to what it is in most of the rest of the Baltic Sea area. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, last question, and then we should finalize. Hans, please. Thank you. Robert, uh, I thought that was quite an interesting presentation. It, not that I understood everything. But the last thing, what you said, that was something about uh, the conditioning. Uh, uh, on, I think, I'm not sure if I should say national conditioning of these processes. Could you say a little bit more about that in particular also about uh, other social conditionings such as risk aversion uh, and things of that sort? Would you expect that, say, the Catholic South is responding differently than the more Protestant North, things of that sort? Would the post-communistic East respond differently to the uh, uh, previous, no, it's still the Western Europe? I would say yes, but, <laughs> I don't but could you say anything on, on how well, that well, there, works? There's, I know only about uh, the, the, the welfare state literature in the sense that uh, how countries adopt uh, policies is very much influenced by their traditions of adopting policies, and it, this, this goes back for, for centuries or ages even. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine that uh, religion, uh, these kinds of things are interest uh, are. Um, uh, explanatory factors as well, and, it, and, and I know for welfare state adoption, these kinds of things are, are taken into account in explaining the, uh, the adoption process. But I'm, I haven't done it for climate change uh, adaptation. But it would be interesting to see whether countries which are more Protestant than Catholic are also taking a different approach in, in an adaptation to climate change. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, before closing the session. Um